Hi, welcome back to Joe Blogs. In today's episode, I want to provide you with an update as to what's happening in China, and more specifically, what's going on with China's Belt and Road Initiative. The Belt and Road Initiative was launched officially in 2013 as a way of helping emerging and developing countries to build up their infrastructure. China decided that it was going to support all of these countries both financially and also in the construction process. It was going to send its companies and its people to all of these places to help develop things like road, rail, airports, power stations and all of the things that you need to develop your economy. Now, although the term Belt and Road Initiative was coined in 2013, China actually started investing overseas in the early part of this century, so they built up a significant portfolio. Now, information on the Belt and Road Initiative is difficult to come by because China doesn't publish any official statistics. However, a research agency called Aid Data has published a comprehensive report where they've looked at over 20,000 different projects that China have been supporting over the last 20 years. So in today's video, we'll look at the scale of the Belt and Road Initiative. We'll look at the deployment of funds, how China has actually structured those deals, what's happening with regards to the interest rates and the levels of distress, and then finally today I'll wrap up with my summary as to what I think is likely to happen over the course of the next 12 to 18 months with the Belt and Road Initiative and what the impact of that will be on the Chinese economy. But before we get started on all of that, I wanted to tell you something really exciting about this guy. I've decided to give this away as part of a raffle prize. Now this is an electroplated resin statue of a balloon dog and the balloon dog does have some relevance to my channel. If you've been a long-standing viewer, you may have seen that I did a video on a toy called Squeaky a very long time ago. And if you'd like a chance of winning that statue, a genuine Joe Blog statue, then please check out the video at the end of today's video. All of the information in today's video has been taken from a report called Belt and Road Reboot, published in November 2023 by Aid Data. And Aid Data is a research lab at William and Mary University based in Virginia, USA. The findings in this report focus on the period between 2014 and 2021. And the reason that it doesn't go beyond 21 is that it's very difficult to actually be able to find the data on China's Belt and Road Initiative. China doesn't publish any official figures, and so Aid Data have had to pull together all of the information from individual sources, which has taken a long period of time. And also, in terms of the scale of China's investment into this initiative, this map of the world shows the location of all of the projects. And at the end of 2021, aid data have estimated that there were 20,985 projects in 146 different countries with a total investment value of $1.34 trillion. The Belt and Road Initiative covers every low-income, lower-middle-income and upper-middle-income country in the world and has live projects in every major world region, including Africa, Asia, Oceania, the Middle East, Latin America and the Caribbean, and Central and Eastern Europe. President Xi of China officially launched the Belt and Road Initiative during an official visit to Kazakhstan in September 2013. However, as you can see from this graphic, that wasn't actually the first time that China made investments into overseas countries. And interestingly, in the two years following the start of the global financial crisis in 2008, China actually ramped up the level of its overseas investment to around $120 billion in 2009 and $100 billion in 2010. However, as you can see from this graphic, there was an increase in the level of overseas investment in 2013, which was the year that the Belt and Road Initiative was launched. The amount of investment actually fell in 2014 as a result of the slowdown in the global economy that took place in that year. There was a bounce back in 2015 and 2016, which actually was the biggest single year of investment for China when it invested between 130 and 140 billion dollars. And since that time, the total amount of investment each year has been declining. Now, one thing that's really interesting to note in terms of what's changed over the last 10 years with the Belt and Road Initiative is the currency that China has been using to make overseas investments. This graph shows the composition of China's loan portfolio by currency of denomination. The green line at the top of this chart represents investments made in US dollars. 
The red line at the bottom of the chart represents investments made in Chinese Yuan or renminbi, and the grey line at the bottom of the chart shows other currencies. The scale on the left hand side here goes from 0 to 100%, and the axis across the bottom shows the period between 2000 and 2021. So we start off by looking at 2013, which was the year that the Belt and Road Initiative started. You can see that in that year, more than 90% of all of China's investments were made in US dollars. And the reason for that is that historically, the US dollar has been one of the most stable currencies. And therefore, by investing in US dollars, you have a currency that you can rely upon not to devalue significantly and therefore cause you major issues with regards to exchange rates. The US dollar is widely used in trade deals for things like oil and gas. And as a result of that, the vast majority of countries are comfortable taking on debt that's denominated in US dollars because everybody tends to understand the exchange rate between their home currency and the greenback. However, I think what's really interesting about this chart is that in the period between 2013 and 2021, there's been a significant reduction in the proportion of loans being issued in US dollars and a proportionate increase in loans being issued in Chinese Yuan. And if you look at the shape of the green line and the red line, you can see that they actually crossed over in 2020, when China for the first time issued more loans in its own currency than US dollars. And that trend continued in the following year. And by 2021, 50.5% of China's total loan portfolio was denominated in Chinese Yuan and 44% in US dollars. And what that tells us is that China has changed its strategy entirely. It no longer relies on the US dollar and all of the loans that it's making are being made in Chinese Yuan. And one of the reasons that that's important is that the easiest way for these countries who are taking on the loans to be able to get Yuan to pay back those loans is by doing trade with China. So what we're seeing here is a situation where the dependency on China and its trade relations is increasing for all of these countries. And if they get to a situation where they can't actually pay back these loans in cash, then other deals may be struck where trade or other assets could be exchanged for Chinese Yuan to repay that debt. Now, the way that China structures its investments for the Belt and Road Initiative is by providing loans. So the money that's put into all of these projects around the world are loans that have to be repaid by the host country. And this chart shows the split between the loans that have a fixed rate of interest and those that have a variable rate dating back to the year 2000. Now, no official data has been published by China advising what the rate on these loans is. But from the data that aid data has compiled, it's estimated that the interest on these loans ranges between 0.5% and 3%. But what's interesting about this chart is that over the last 20 years, there's been a significant increase in the percentage of loans being provided with a variable rate and a consequential reduction in the number of loans being given with a fixed rate. And the reason that that's important is that a variable rate, by definition, is variable and therefore can be increased by China if they consider that the risk profile is getting worse. And if we focus in on 2013, which was the start of the Belt and Road Initiative, you can see by that point, around 80% of all of the loans that China was issuing were variable rate. And over the last 10 years, the percentage of variable rate loans has increased and is now sitting above 90%. And obviously, from a borrower's point of view, that's bad news. If you take on a loan that has a fixed rate, you know exactly what the rate of interest is going to be on that loan for the rest of its life. However, if you've got a variable rate that's set by your lender and your lender suddenly decides that it wants to increase the amount of interest that you're having to pay, there is nothing you can do about that. And that's the situation that the vast majority of these countries are now facing. Now, in addition to the rate of interest that's being charged on the loan, China also charges penalty interest rates for countries that are no longer compliant with the original terms and conditions of their loan. So this may be a situation where a country is unable to make its interest payments or gets to the point where it's actually defaulting on the loan itself. And this chart shows how the penalty rate of interest has changed. On the early Belt and Road Initiative deals, the penalty rate of interest was on average 0.58%. However, on the later stage loans, that penalty rate of interest has been increased to 1.18%. And of course, this is a major concern for these countries involved, because if you get to the stage where you're in default and you can't actually afford the payments, the last thing that you want to do is have penalty interest added on top of the original interest because it makes it even less affordable and just increases the amount of money that you owe to China. 
This chart shows the percentage of China's official sector lending commitments that are backed by collateral, which is basically an agreement whereby China can take ownership of the assets that are being developed as part of the project. Now, interestingly, this chart goes back to the year 2000, which is before the Belt and Road Initiative was officially launched. And you can see that in 2000, only 19% of all of China's loans had some sort of asset backing. If we now focus in on 2013, you can see that 60% of the entire loan book had collateral support. However, by 2021, that figure had increased to 72%. And the reason that this is important for the host countries is that they run the risk of losing control of their own assets if they can't keep up the repayments on the debt that's being provided by China. And a great example of this is Hambantota Port in Sri Lanka. The Belt and Road Initiative supported the development of Hambantota Port, However, Sri Lanka was unable to keep up its repayments, and as a result of that, China signed a 99-year lease and now have full control and ownership over that part of Sri Lanka. And the fact that China now have unabated access to that port has raised security concerns in India, which is very close to Sri Lanka, because they're worried that China could set up a military base, and this has also raised concerns in the USA. And I think this issue of collateral is probably one of the most contentious parts of the Belt and Road Initiative, because if China decides that it wants to enforce on all of the loans that are in default, it could take over a serious amount of assets all across the world. One of the big questions surrounding the Belt and Road Initiative is how are all of these countries going to actually repay the debt? Where will they be able to get the cash from to make the lump sum repayment once these loans become due? And this chart shows the profile of when all of the Belt and Road Initiative loans will reach their projected repayment date. The scale on the left-hand side of this chart goes from 0 to 100%, and across the bottom we're showing the years from 2000 to 2050. So as you can see, currently 44% of all the Belt and Road Initiative loans have reached their repayment date. However, as you can see, there is a steep profile over the next 20 years, and by 2050, every single loan will be due for repayment. Now, realistically, the only way that these countries will actually be able to repay China is if the assets have actually been constructed and are generating serious amounts of cash, and therefore they would be able to raise some sort of bond finance, some sort of alternative loan to repay China. But those loans would need to be cheaper than the Chinese deals. And one of the problems that a lot of these countries are facing is that they are still high-risk economies, they don't generate huge amounts of cash, and therefore it's unlikely whether or not the majority of them would be able to actually issue any bond finance to repay the Chinese loans. So realistically, the only other party they're going to be dealing with is China on some sort of rescheduling. This chart shows the percentage of China's portfolio of loan commitments supporting countries in financial distress. After the Belt and Road Initiative was launched, Chinese state-owned creditors went on a lending spree, issuing thousands of loans for big-ticket infrastructure projects spread across countries in the developing world. However, they did so without strong risk management guardrails in place and lent to borrowers with bad credit ratings or no credit rating at all. Countries such as Laos, Zambia, South Sudan, Suriname, Zimbabwe, Tajikistan, Pakistan and Argentina. As a result of this strategy, Chinese state-owned creditors are saddled with many underperforming loans and are now looking to ensure that their overseas borrowers are sufficiently liquid to continue servicing their existing infrastructure debts. And this chart highlights the scale of the problem. Back in 2000, the total percentage of China's portfolio to countries in distress was sitting at 34%. Today it's sitting at 79%. So the vast majority of all of this debt has been provided to countries that are in financial distress. And this chart shows the composition of China's loan portfolio by financial instrument. The dark blue line at the top of this chart shows infrastructure project lending. The red line shows what's classified as emergency lending. So a situation where a rescue deal needs to be put in place urgently for these projects. And the gray line are other loans. And the scale on the left-hand side of this chart goes from 0 to 80%, and across the bottom we've got the years from 2000 to 2021. So you can see that back in 2000, around 70% of all of the loans were infrastructure project loans, and emergency lending represented around 30%. However, in the period between 2001 and 2013, the amount of emergency lending was less than 10%. 
But over the last 10 years, the level of emergency lending has increased dramatically and the percentage of infrastructure project lending has fallen. And you can see from the shape of the charts that in 2020, emergency lending actually became the biggest part of the portfolio overtaking infrastructure project lending. And in 2021, emergency loans, so bailout loans, represented over 58% of the total portfolio. And if you look at the shape of the chart, you can see that emergency lending has been taking off for the last 10 years. And if that trend continues, it's likely that the vast majority of China's portfolio will end up as emergency lending rather than infrastructure project lending. And this really shows how the poor decision making and the lack of credit judgment is now starting to hurt the portfolio. And this chart shows the total number of cancelled or suspended infrastructure projects between 2000 and 2021. So as you can see, back in 2000, there were no projects that had been cancelled or suspended. Between 2000 and the start of the Belt and Road Initiative in 2013, there was a gradual increase in the number of projects that were cancelled. And by 2013, that figure was sitting at around 15. However, in the period between 2013 and 2021, there was a rapid increase in the number of projects that were cancelled. And by 2021, 94 projects representing total debt outstanding of $56 billion had been cancelled or suspended. And when you look at the steep profile of this chart and take into account the fact that it only covers the period up until 2021, so it doesn't really include all of the financial stress that's been put on the global economy over the last two years, it's highly likely that the number of cancelled or suspended projects has increased significantly over the last two years. So what's the summary and conclusion today? Well, I wanted to post this video because the Belt and Road Initiative is the biggest single overseas form of investment that any country has made in the last 20 years. As we've seen in today's video, China has provided over $1.3 trillion worth of finance as part of the Belt and Road Initiative. But the problem that China has is that the creditworthiness of a lot of the countries that it's been providing finance to is not particularly high. And they've now got to a situation where a lot of those countries are struggling to be able to make even the interest payments, never mind the actual repayment of the debt itself. Now, this was fine when China was doing really well because China could afford to keep supporting all of these projects. But the problem that China finds itself in today is that its own economy has gone into a slowdown mode and the performance of the economy in 2023 has been far lower than the authorities originally expected. At the start of this year, China was expecting to hit around 7% GDP growth. Now they're hoping to hit 5%. However, there's still a big question mark over whether or not they will achieve that because exports have actually fallen year on year. And the current purchasing managers index, which tells us what's happening with companies, whether they're growing or contracting, indicates that Chinese companies are still in contraction mode. So they're actually not doing as much business as they thought they would be. So everything's pointing in the wrong direction. And as a result of the underperformance, the Chinese Yuan has fallen in value significantly over the last 12 months, which is making matters worse. And if you follow the channel, you may have seen that I recently posted a video talking about deflation in the Chinese economy. Consumer prices have fallen year on year in October and the producer price index or what's known as the factory gate prices have fallen in every single month in the last 12 months. So all of this data tells us that China is really struggling right now. And what we've seen in today's video is that the Belt and Road Initiative is far from being done. Very few of the projects that China have financed have actually been completed. They're in a semi-built phase. And the only thing that you can do with something that's partially constructed is to keep financing it, actually get it through to completion so that it can start generating some cash flow. And the projects that China have been financing are things like power stations, hydroelectric dams, airports, roads, railways. So all of these are completely worthless unless they are finished. So China now finds itself in a very difficult position where it's really committed to continuing to support a lot of these projects or it needs to write off the full amount of its investment. And that's the last thing that the Chinese authorities want to do. 
But as we've seen from the data today, 79% of the loans that China have made are to countries that are in financial distress. There was very little in terms of credit analysis done at the start of the Belt and Road Initiative. China doesn't seem to have done its homework in terms of deciding which countries were the right place to deploy its capital. And it now finds itself in a very difficult situation. But as we've also talked about in today's video, the finance that's been provided by China isn't free. It's actually a loan. So China is charging interest to all of these countries, which is actually making the situation worse because it's increasing the amount of debt that these countries have to repay. And it's also taking collateral. So China has a charge over the assets that are being constructed. So the most likely outcome here is that China will continue to support these projects. It will put more money in. But the trade-off for that is that it's likely that China will want to take full control of those assets and all of the cash flow that it generates. And as I mentioned earlier in the video, Hambantota port is a great example. This was a port in Sri Lanka that the Chinese authorities were funding. Sri Lankan authorities couldn't afford to keep up the repayments. And as a result, China now has a 99-year ownership lease of that port in Sri Lanka. And it's likely as we move forward that that situation will repeat itself in many countries around the world. The 146 countries that have exposure to the Belt and Road Initiative may find that China suddenly starts owning its power stations and airports and railways and roads. And that could obviously cause some major political problems going forward because the Chinese will then have leverage over those countries if these countries become dependent on those power stations and airports and railway networks and China owns them, then that will obviously leave that country exposed to some political leverage. China could start telling that country that it wants to do more trade, it wants to do more business and maybe wants to open more factories. And so we've got a really interesting relationship that's starting to build up coming from China, but spreading all across the world. And I think that's what's causing concern about the Belt and Road Initiative globally, is that China isn't just lending the money to these countries. There's actually a sting in the tail where China could end up taking over the assets and then having some influence on the governments in all of these areas. But if we take a step back from the political issue and talk about the financial implications, China has a really big burden here. The $1.3 trillion that it's already put out of the door is gone. That's a sunk cost. They're not going to get that back unless they follow their money, continue investing into all these countries, complete the builds, and then they've got assets that actually have some value. So the Chinese authorities are facing a big dilemma. They need to continue investing at a time when their own economy is shrinking and the money would be better invested back into China. So this is a rock and a hard place from China's point of view. They absolutely need to keep investing into these infrastructure projects in order for them to have some end value. However, it's coming at a time when the cash flow situation from China's point of view is really tight because of what's happening in its home market. And there is a very real chance here that China could find itself not having enough liquidity, therefore not being able to support all of these projects overseas. And a lot of those projects are now at risk of going to rack and ruin and never being finished. And that's obviously a disaster from each individual country's point of view, but it's also a disaster from China's perspective because the investment that it's made so far could be completely worthless. So the overall summary of today's video is that what we've seen from the aid data report is that the $1.3 trillion that China has invested into the Belt and Road Initiative is very much still at risk. And China could lose a huge chunk of that unless it's prepared to put more money into all of those projects. But the problem that China has is that now is not a good time to be investing overseas because they need to focus on their own economy. And there is a real risk that a lot of the Belt and Road Initiative projects will never be finished and therefore will not help those countries to develop their infrastructure. And overall, could be negative in terms of the global economy because if those countries lose their critical source of investment, it's likely that their economies will start to shrink. And as we've talked about before, there is a domino effect for every single country in the world. If we have a shrinking economy anywhere, it will have a knock-on impact to other economies. So the overall summary here is that the Belt and Road Initiative is not going well for China and there's a real risk that it could get much worse, which is really negative for the Chinese economy, but also could have a negative impact on the global economy. Hopefully you've enjoyed today's video, you found it useful, informative and thought-provoking. If you've liked what I've said, then please give me a thumbs up. 
Thank you for watching this video all the way through to the end. And don't forget, if you'd like to win this statue here, please check out the video that I've posted, which you can watch after I put a smile on your face. I'm constantly being asked about the statues in the background of my video and I've got some really exciting news for you. I've decided to give one of these away as a prize. This guy here who's an electro-plated resin statue of a balloon dog and if you've been watching my channel for a while you'll know that I once posted a video about a balloon dog called Squeaky. Now this is a really fantastic piece, really reflective, quite heavy and would make a great addition to any home. And you can win this for just £1, which is the equivalent of around $1.30, so really affordable. So rather than buying me a coffee or sending me a YouTube super thanks, why don't you buy a ticket in the raffle that I've set up to win this? Now to keep things above board, I've got an independent company to take the cash for me and do the draw. So everything will be entirely independent. I won't be picking the winner. It will be all at random. But I will post this to anybody in the world that wins it. There is a possibility that you might need to pay a little bit of import tax, depending on where you live and what the import duties are. But this is your opportunity to win a genuine Joe Blog sculpture. So buy yourself a ticket and good luck in the draw.